Hello, Jack. We have isolated the sound and compared it with hundreds of similar ones. We've exhausted the field of sounds produced by industrial machinery, coin-operated machines, and domestic appliances. Do you recognize this sound? Oh, that's the Uptown A train. And this? That's a jogger getting beaten up with a vintage Shea Stadium Bat Day mini bat. And this? I have no idea what that is. Ah, it's a fabulous Siberian bird that doesn't really exist. I see. Bring in the perverts. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to The Horrible Idea. This is Stephanie. That was Jack. <clears throat> and we talk about scary movies. Um, you can get in touch with us on Instagram at The Horrible idea or on twitter at horrible pod yes um tell us what wonderful film we will be talking about today yeah so um this is the bird with the crystal plumage i you can say the italian name Alucello dalle piume di cristallo. Uh, perfect. <laughs> um, this was released February 19th, 1970, directed and written by Dario Argento. The budget was about uh, f- uh, half a million dollars, and it grossed about a million dollars or 1.65 billion lira. Uh, yeah, so the the lira I kind of kept forgetting because everything kept being like a hundred thousand dollars. Well, yeah. not dollars, but a hundred thousand, and I was like, Jesus, this guy's throwing money around. But yeah, conversion yeah, rates. I went to I went to Italy right before it changed over to the euro, and it was I think fifteen hundred lira for a dollar. Um, IMDb gave this a seven point two out of ten. Uh, Rotten Tomatoes critics gave it a 92, and Rotten Tomato audiences gave it an 80. Oh. Um, yeah, so this is our first Giallo film. And uh, Giallo is a uh, Italian sort of, um, I guess it's horror and thriller and mystery yeah. kind of combined. Um Giallo means yellow in Italian for the color of like cheap paperbacks. So it's sort of like the English the English version would be like a pulp. Yeah, or like the Penny Dreadfuls or yeah. Yeah. And um and the most famous Giallo director is uh probably Dario Argento. And this is his first film. Um that he directed. That he directed. Because he was a screenwriter yes. before this, right? Yeah. Yeah, he wrote a couple of famous uh, spaghetti westerns. And um, he kind of, see. I've seen a bunch of his films, but I, in reading, I've actually, his later films are kind of not considered giallo anymore because they're more um, Hollywood. Su- supernatural horror. So there isn't like as much of a sort of mystery and suspense. Sure. Um, yeah. So this one is, though. Uh, yeah it's apparently this is the movie why in some circles i suppose he was called the italian hitchcock yeah it's much more apparent in so (laughs) this movie was fine it was cool um but if you're going to watch a giallo film and watch a dario argento giallo film i highly recommend opera which is in every way superior to this film and is f- weird as fuck. And is weird in all those ways that uh, Dario Argento is known to be weird. Uh, with his constant musical collaborator, Goblin. And um, lots of other music. And uh, yeah, opera is just a really cool film. Uh, what can you tell us about this film? Oh, um, 
So I just have a bird fact, which is that the Hornetus nivalis bird species doesn't actually exist. And the one that is seen in the film is played by a gray-crowned crane. Yeah, Fraser Crane's uh, other brother. And um, we'll be doing bird facts from now on for all films. <laughs> yes, yeah. Uh, preconceptions, had you ever seen this or a Jello film before? No, um, I hadn't heard of this movie. I'd heard of Dario Argento and um, about Profondo Rosso and, and Suspiria, um, but uh, but not this. Um, and I knew of Aja Argento um, because of her relationship with JT Leroy. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, so I saw Suspiria the original and and opera and a couple of other Dario Argento films. And I've been like pretty obsessed with Asia Argento for a long time. She was in a, a very weird, very um, indie film called New Rose Hotel, which is based on a William Gibson short story that is weird as fuck. Um, and she was in a couple of her father's movies and then she was in a relationship with Anthony Bourdain kind of right before he uh, passed away. Um, Yeah. And as I said, opera is a better film. Um, Plot breakdown. Do you want to break down that plot? In Italy, an American writer named Sam Dalmas witnesses the attempted murder of Monica Ranieri the wife of an art gallery owner, not Keith Ranieri, the right. Nexium cult leader, a couple of days before returning to the U.S. Inspector Morosini, who is in charge of investigating the three previous murders by a serial killer, asks for Dalmas' help. He also takes his passport. Dalmas decides to stay in Italy with his girlfriend, Julia, to help the police with the investigation. The killer finds and threatens Dalmas and Julia by phone, and the police overhear a strange noise on the recording of the call. It is the cries of the titular bird. Soon, the stereo killer stalks Julia and Sam. Who might it be? We won't won't give the spoilers away. Mostly because I don't act like... I had to watch it three times to understand the ending. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, yeah, so we'll we'll get there. Um, (laughs) So... um, I just have to come right off the bat and say, loved the himbo icon, Sam Dalmas. Yeah. Just the worst amateur detective of all time. <laughs> like, he's just, yep, he's just, uh, it's a good thing he's pretty. Um, Which is weird he's... because, like, the the police department in this, like, I you know, did I don't think it was Rome. It was, like, some... Random. I think it was supposed to be Rome. Okay. Because the police seemed like unbelievably capable and had like this whole weird like science division and stuff. And they're just like, hey, dude, can you solve this for us? Also, like, (laughs) well, well, yeah. So, well, I don't know. I guess we could just break into it. So uh, the, the police are just basically like, yeah, you're just sort of like this writer who's here on vacation but can you help us solve this murder <laughs> right in fact <laughs> and, you have to we're gonna take yeah. away your passport <laughs> we're, we're detaining you <laughs> as a state asset <laughs> like, um and he's just like he waits until the last like 20 minutes of the film to find the guy who painted the the artwork right which was like yeah. the very first clue he got <laughs> like, i don't know <laughs> so anyway um yeah like uh, so i guess we can start well no do you want to work on the questions or do you want to talk through the sure plot? yeah no go through the questions so we first. have some we have some questions here so i'll say you know i'll start with what i've already been talking about which is is Sam Dalmas the worst amateur detective of all time? <laughs> like, he just sort of, like, we kind of, um, you know, played on it in the intro, but I love the scene where he's talking to the scientist and they, they bring him in and they're like, 
Okay, we got these two phone calls from the killer, and now we've analyzed the audio. Here, Sam Dalmas, we're going to play them for you. And they're like, bloop, here's the first one. Okay, now here's the second one. Bloop. Did you notice anything? He's like, yeah, they're different. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. He was very funny. Um, but, you know, yeah, God I mean, give him credit for out. trying. <laughs> yeah. Sort of. <laughs> Yeah, it took him a while, you know. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like, I, but although I did read, so I did read that this is like a a thing that Argento has done in other films where kind of part of the plot or kind of the mystery hinges on someone's memory. Right. Um, And that's a big thing because like um, Sam's just kind of like walking home from his gig writing a wasn't he like doing a like gig writing about birds or something for his yeah he friend? was yeah he was just sort of like writing about anything he could and he yeah. got a job for some bird magazine or book yeah I did like that walk and talk in the beginning where they just walk past like a billion birds yeah. and then the bird doesn't come back until the last like fifteen minutes but anyway um but so he's like walking home and he witnesses this murder or attempted murder like we said um the the woman doesn't die but but so the police kind of keep him because they're he's like i remember something about it but i don't know what it is he like couldn't remember what it was that was like significant or whatever right i think what what you're saying about the memory and stuff so the thing about dario argento that i've read and i've also seen like he is very much I was trying to like describe what an auteur is. And one of the things that I think makes like an auteur director is they have like a really sort of um, a definable vision that they use often. So like you could be a good sure. director, but you don't have like these sort of like things. So he definitely – you know, him being a good director or not is debatable a, a lot of time. But um, he definitely has, like, a very particular vision and particular visuals he comes back to over and over again and sort of, like, perfects. And his career has this very interesting arc in that, like, he starts with a lot of movies like this that are sort of these, you know, movie versions of a pulp novel and then they get more like sexual and weird and they get better they get like because he gets some money and he i guess knows what to do with money and so then in like the 80s he makes like suspiria and he makes um opera and he makes these other like really cool movies and then they bring him to america and then everything he makes sucks a lot like he well yeah there's like a whole theory of of critics or you know people who enjoy movies who think you should never just give a director everything they want because yeah. uh, oftentimes the most creative um you know works come from limitations like you know the smaller budgets or you know having to work with practical effects or right. you know whatever um I think it's part it's partly that it's also partly like he got a little like Hollywood liked him for a while and I think he tried to make Hollywood movies and he can make really good Dario Argento movies and really bad Hollywood movies so um that was it. I was I would say this is like a fairly like you know well well plotted um tight thriller like yeah. If anything, it felt a little more like traditional than, and it it kind of makes sense. Like, so this is nineteen seventy. So you think about like mm-hmm. what's coming out of this, like your um, French connections. You're like lot like that whole school. This is like leading into that, and it's sort of like leaning into a lot of the same. Um, a lot of the same influences and um but yeah, at the same and I time i actually read 
I actually read that this played in cinemas for three and a half years in Italy because it was just wow. so popular. It is yeah. a very Italian movie. And um, there are like some Italian movie tropes that even American movies do. Like, so um, Italian cops being kind of bumbling and, you know, like not really caring. That's like a pretty, that's a pretty well used trope. It's in things like um, Hannibal does it a little bit um when when they go to europe and oh yeah potsy potsy yeah. and um what's the uh the da vinci code does it a little bit um but one of my questions is is there any subgenre more dated than giallo because it really it really felt like a it felt like the 70s man yeah even the late 60s yeah i mean for sure yeah, there's a lot of like, I, I mean, I guess it's kind of when genre was still sort of, you know, I don't know. I feel like it wasn't taken as, as seriously. Well, I mean, I guess like you had had like the, the Hitchcock, uh, you know, films that were taken pretty, pretty seriously. And, and this feels in the vein of this definitely feels very influenced by by Hitchcock. Um, yeah. It also even feels with, like, like the blonde girlfriend. <laughs> like, right. Um, it's also like that thing where it's not fighting its genre. It's not like trying to be something else. It is like trying to be a really good, like gritty thriller slash. Yeah. Movie. And it's got like a couple twists and, yeah. um, you know, some gratuitous, uh, bad stabbings. Like, <laughs> Yeah, the 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 stabbers are not particularly good at stabbing people because like uh, they apparently killed three people before it, but almost nobody nobody they nobody they stab dies once the movie starts. No, the the girl in the bed, um, right? That with the lecherous panty snatching yes that, that woman that, dies that panty scene and then the one pulled. in the staircase um that goes up the staircase with the match she right my other question is is bring in the perverts the best line ever <laughs> yeah i really liked that whole scene like i'd love that they were in like a little theater yeah uh, with the like the lineup like you know in in most at least american uh cop movies they're in like a little room but this the they like brought them in they were on a stage right um what was the, the trans they brought in the, name? the transvestite woman and then they said um no no i said the perverts that's a transvestite it's different <laughs> yeah uh well no the hold on it was ursula andrus ursula andrus yeah they're like quit bringing ursula andrus in she's a transvestite not a pervert and i was like well it's handled a little strangely but at least argento was like no you know being trans is not a perversion right. uh you know so i was like all right well at least you're making that distinction um so I think from there now we can move on to favorite characters. Yes. Uh, which this movie has, like, every person is a character. It um, does. Except for the murdered women who have no personality or uh, voice. Well, they're, really, but... they're ingenues. Um, yeah, it has it has archetypes. It has, like, you know, noir type I mean, characters. I mean, kind of. <laughs> I don't know that I've ever seen another movie where there's a guy who's a painter who has no entrance to his home, raises cats to eat them. Uh, that was a pretty unique, uh, you know. Fair, fair, fair. Pretty unique guy. Also, like, the there is the the pimp with the stutter called So Long, um, <laughs> because he had to say so long at the end of each sentence, which was I... Was he a pimp? Because he kept saying, do I look like a pimp? <laughs> yeah, he also was like... I've never, so I have not lived with a stutter for an extended period of time. I had a stutter when I was a teenager, but, um, but I was like, I, I wonder if this is like a actual technique that people use 
like adding a little sign off or if that's just well, this guy yeah <laughs> and it could have been like a sort of a, a Tourette's stutter sort of overlap sure well and then there's his buddy that he gets to go to Sam and I think that buddy kind of rips Sam off but the friend keeps saying like no I don't have anything for you I'll let you know in 10 minutes <laughs> Yeah, and then he's that like, was like no, a... I don't know anything. All right, I know something. Here you go. <laughs> was... Yeah, that was like a thiefy kind of like I can't explicitly tell you what. I mean, yeah, those yeah. characters. They, I like them all. No, um, they were, and the lecherous gay uh, antique dealer. Yes, that was um, my favorite. He's a sort of he's a very he's a popular European character actor. He's German. His name is Werner Peters, and he kind of plays that character a lot um just like a sort of effeminate character Blood, that is, like, uh yeah like predator yeah <laughs> he's sort of like oh, he also played Sam he played predator in the movie so yeah unhinged that jaw um there's also the bird expert who yes. it was very weird where they were hanging out and he plays the bird expert the tape and then him and Sam and Julia just suddenly start getting it on. That was really was weird. Like, that felt like a very seventies like, Italian thing. Like, all right, I yeah. guess I'll, uh, I guess I'll let you guys. Uh, yeah. And I was like, did I miss a line of dialogue? Like, what happened? Because she just like is like, ha ha, and then she jumps in the bed, and then the friend is kind of sitting there laughing. Like he seemed like he was high, maybe, and he's like, all right, you maniacs, I'm getting out of here. But. Uh, yeah, there are a lot of there are a lot of characters in this. Oh, the guy who is like the um he's got the yellow coat on, the guy who like runs right, over yeah, yeah. their bodyguard in his car and then the hired he like disappears. Killer. Yeah, he's like a hired gun and then he disappears into this convention of all these like ex prize fighters that yes. all have the same yellow coat on. Pugili. <laughs> Ooh, which yeah. brings which brings me to my great anecdote that this instead of my pitch of the week, I'll give you the anecdote of um so uh my last name is very Italian and um I knew that my like great great grandfather was a famous prize fighter in Italy and he won like the the European Golden Gloves or whatever. And I'd always heard that, but I'd never really um, learned that much about it until the first time I went to Italy and I was staying at a hotel and I went to check out. And he goes, hey, Kaviki, I like the boxer. And I was like, mm. yeah. And, and he like upgraded my room. <laughs> oh, there you go. And then I then I like looked it up and I saw some pictures of him and stuff. He was a stud. And uh, yeah, it's very uh, famous fighter. It's all about who you know yep. or who you're related to. Um, so uh, speaking of Italy and the Italian language, so I got this on Blu-ray and I put it on and it was the English dub. Um, and then I was like, oh, at first I was like, oh, it's in English. And then I was like, wait, no, the dub is off. So then I was like, okay, I'm going to switch it to Italian since that's like the language it was recorded in. And I started watching it in Italian and the dub was also off for the Italian because it's dubbed both ways, I guess. But like for some characters, the English dub looked great. Like for Sam, the English dub looked great. And then for, so I was like, I know he's an American actor. Did he act it in English? Yeah. And then the other characters acted in Italian because, yeah, the dub was not great either way. Like... So I, I looked this up a little. So because of a lot of sound and such. Um, so basically he would do his dialogue in English and various other characters would either do it in English or Italian or sometimes they would do a little mix of things or try to they would mouth English um, yeah, because sometimes the English dub looked like perfect, and then right. I would switch back to Italian, and I was like, "No, this is." But wrong. then, because of know. the because of the sound, they would just redub everything. Yeah, both times. So even that actor dubbed himself 
So it is off yeah. sometimes, even when... Um, yeah, neither one was great. So then I was like, I'm just going to switch it to English. Um, yeah. And, you know, but uh, but it was fine. Um, Not to anger the dubs versus subs uh, anime and uh, various other yeah. fandoms. I usually prefer to watch like a foreign language film in the foreign language like with subtitles but with this one i was like well it doesn't because the lip reading being off is distracting to me and also most of the time the dub voice is not like a great actor like the way that the actors in the movie are in this case (laughs) it didn't seem to make the great actors that are in the movie (laughs) oh i thought some of them were pretty good i mean you know um but but that's what I mean. For this one, I was like, there's not a material discernible difference to me. So I was like, I'm just going to listen in English. But um... Cliches. It's interesting. Cause, gloves. Yes, gloves. Um, amateur detectives. Uh, imp- you know, horrible police that are not that are just like bumbling. Um, yeah. I feel like there is a there is an aspect of this in that you could tell it was horror from another culture um, in that it was, you know, it was a little European and it was a little different. It was like a different vibe to it, I felt. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess in Italy, still like 18 to 21 year old women are like the perfect victim. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. And just like the. The sort of stabbing, it, the, like obviously, Dario Argento has, you know, you could say he has sort of go-to cliche sort of imagery that definitely border on like f- fetishy. There's a lot of like, you know, uh, well, struggling and I read that rope. he, yeah, he did all of the glove acting for oh, this. Yeah, he's a great yeah, like he actor. anytime you see the gloved hands, that's right. Dario Argento. Interesting. I've been trying to get into glove acting. You know, I have my Italian uh, ox blood leather gloves from Rome. Oh, so, well, uh, look it up. He might do a glove acting master class. Ooh, nice. I have been. Yeah. Uh, I've been doing some master classes. Uh, the David Lynch one is very good. Uh, do they have a podcast master class? I don't know. They haven't reached out to us yet. So yeah, true. Um, I'm more. I more want to do like a Linda class. Like we'll do oh, some Linda. Nice. Yeah. Uh, it's no longer branded as Linda. It's now LinkedIn. LinkedIn Learning. Yeah. Um. By the way, you can get a free the LinkedIn patriarchy. Learning account through your uh, local library. Usually, uh, definitely the Brooklyn Public Library and New York Public Library. Uh. So what else? What well, reactions? Yeah, so final reactions. Um, this is definitely far more thriller than horror. Um, you know, we already talked about that, but um, which is fine by me. I love a thriller. Um, I, Hitchcock is one of my favorites, and this felt, um, you know, sort of like it, that sort of structure, but with a different, um, you know, vibe. It's it's seventies. It's Italian. It's um, it's got a really weird Ennio Morricone. Uh, store. Uh, we didn't mention that, but he he did the store here. Um, and they had worked together already, I think, on Once Upon a Time in the West. Yeah, I think so, that's before this. Like kind of right after this, Dario Argento started working with this very weird musician named Goblin, who he would work with for like all of his movies going forward. So, yeah, I guess this was the last Morricone. Um, collab but i i liked it although it so he definitely made like some really interesting store for this but then laced into all of the store was just like a woman going like eh, or like <laughs> little weird breathy like moans or something it was a little it was, it was disconcerting um we didn't mention the twist and so we don't have to but um i did when the twist came by the time the twist came, I was like, oh, I know what it is. But it was still satisfying, I feel like. Um, and there were just enough 
even in the parts where I was like, all right, Sam, get it together. Why have you not figured this out? <laughs> like, then they'd throw in some off-the-wall character, and I'd be like, oh, all right, well, I'll, I'll stick with this. <laughs> like, who's this guy? Um, I thought some of the murders were kind of icky. I really didn't like the one where the undies are, like, knifed off. Um, yeah, apparently that scene was the only one that they took out for the American version, and then they... They put it back in when... Uh... Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm i not necessarily pro-cutting scenes out, but I was just like, eh. Um, but uh, one thing I did really... So I like I love the Ennio Morricone store, and I thought the location scouting was really great. Um, that art gallery, it was clearly like a real place. Like they, you know, I mean, maybe they built it for the movie, but that would seem um, kind of wild. I love the... That opening scene um, was really great, just with Sam trapped between the glass. And, um, yeah, it was such an unusual sort of thing. That yeah, never... I mean, it didn't make any sense, but it was cool visually. Yeah. Um, and so that was a great set. His apartment, um, the weird painter's house was like a cool countryside location. So... Whoever did the location scouting, great. Um, and I enjoyed it as, you know, a whodunit and sort of setting the stage for what Argento would go on to do. Obviously, he got weirder and more, um, you know, theatrical and colorful and um, a little bloody, wacky. But... like way more yeah, bloody. Yeah, yeah. So I, I know, you know, obviously everything gets amped up, but I liked it for, you know, for the kind of really sort of across, um, straight across thriller. Um, but that being said, Scare Factor 1, like, even the the kill scenes were just, you know, they were yeah. not scary. <laughs> um, actually, the scariest thing were those phone calls. So that's where my one point goes to were the creepy phone calls. And Ooh. then Entertainment Factor, I'll give it a five because... Um, there were at least five off the charts weird characters in this movie, so <laughs> one point for each of them. Uh, how about you? Yeah, I think I felt very similar. Um, it was kind of a chill movie. Like it was, it you know, it for a thriller, it was pretty low key, and I think I was surprised because I'd seen other others of his films, and they are much more. Um, both graphic and crazy. Whereas we've seen, um, like John Carpenter and um, West Craven. What? West Craven. Yeah, West Craven. Like start out super hardcore and then sort of find a a more um, palatable medium. Um, yeah, actually, this in certain parts reminded me of just some of the ickiness of last house on the left um, yeah and the calls were kind of like um black christmas yes i bit. thought of black christmas with the yeah. phone calls yeah yeah look we have like a whole we have a whole um uh, archive to pull from i know we're we're veritable horror look scholars. at us who'd have thought <laughs> look at us <laughs> um <laughs> and uh yeah it was like a time capsule and so out of all countries outside of this one, I, I've been, I've, I've traveled a bit, but I've traveled most to Italy, and so it was kind of fun seeing Italy and the streets of Italy. And um, there is this sort of weird juxtaposition a lot of times where you could be in like you know Rome, you could be in like this crazy old Gothic cathedral, and then like you go down the block, and there's this like hyper minimalist kind of modernist place and then you take a train for five minutes and you're like it's all farms and orchards and not weird cat eating artists yes yes yes. (laughs) Uh, i never had a cat but there there were there were at least two times where i'm like wow what is this oh horse oh okay that's cool um (laughs) yeah um but I think I give it the same uh, the same as you. One for scare factor, as in it was not scary. 
and uh, five for entertainment factor, as in uh, I was half entertained. Exactly one half entertained. Um, but yeah, it's it's visually cool, and uh, I think yeah, I'm, just vibing out with himbo detective icon Sam yeah. Dolis. <laughs> Obviously, you're going to be saying vibing out a lot. Uh, uh, that's your new thing. And himbo um, icon. You know. Yes, uh, there is something like I I feel like I'm beginning to appreciate like uh, somebody who has a lot to say and maybe is not fully capable of saying all those things in understandable ways is preferable to someone who has nothing to say, who, you know, orchestrates a, uh, perfect production. Well, and it's also, you know, I think there is something to be said also for the fact that apparently behind the scenes, like Dario Argento was almost taken off of this movie a couple times. Um, and his dad was like a film producer. So he kind of was like, no, let my son finish his movie. Yes. Um, and so I there think a... he probably wasn't fully unleashed as far as what he could or would eventually go on to do. Whereas later on in his career, he's like, okay, I have every um, toy. I can kind of do whatever I want. Or I have carte blanche to like splatter color and blood and whatever everywhere. So. Yeah, there is a sort of tradition of... Uh of that in Italian cinema uh, as in, in the uh, Dino De Laurentiis, Giada De Laurentiis sort of. Uh, well, and even like, with now with he's, you know, Aja has directed. some. Have you ever seen Asia Argento's tattoo? She has this angel coming from her sort of pubis. Yeah, it sounds familiar. What do we have coming up next? So join us on our next episode where we'll be talking about John Carpenter's 80s classic, The Thing. It is from the 80s, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. In the meantime, review us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, wherever you listen. We're also on Spotify. Don't be scared. Yeah. And uh, if you have any interesting facts about Jalo films... Or uh, The Thing, either the, I think the original was in like the 40s, and then there's this one, and then there was a remake in the aughts. Uh, of The Thing? Yes. Any of yeah, The Yeah, this things. one's 1982. Yes. But yeah. Um, or if you have a suggestion for a movie that might scare us, please let us know. Or if you are working on a horror film and want to tell us all about it. Or if you are a murderer and <laughs> never mind, uh, scratch <laughs> that <laughs> If you are a glove actor, oh, and... glove actors, all please apply. Yes, yes, I'll I'll take your call anytime. Or Danny Glover, or uh... yeah, uh, let us know on Twitter or email us at thehorribleidea at gmail dot com. Uh, bring in the perverts. Bring in the perverts. Send in the clowns. <laughs> <laughs>